The title of this video is a lie. Before you click away though, it's also not clickbait. We are going to talk about the Radium Girls. Yet describing the events in this video as a failure is inaccurate, and I want that to be very clear in your mind as you listen to the story that follows. All that came to pass was the result of the system working as intended, and it took many deaths and a group of brave women and their allies standing on a figurative mountain screaming out for justice to finally change things for the better. Never forget that. In 1911, Marie Curie won the Nobel Prize for discovering the radioactive elements of radium and polonium, and nobody, not even her, yet understood the true danger that the substances posed. The phenomena of radioactivity was a relatively new concept, only discovered barely 15 years prior by Henry Becquerel and later investigated by the Curies. By the time 1920 came along, though, the United States was absolutely enchanted by radium. Manufacturers began incorporating small amounts of it in just about anything you could imagine, from radium facial creams to radium impregnated water jars to radium snake oil tonics and even radium suppositories. Guess what? The United States got a fever. And the only prescription is more radium. According to the manufacturers of such products, the radium used within was a panacea that could cure just about anything under the sun, even if many of said products likely didn't actually have any radium in them. One way, I guess, that unregulated capitalism probably saved some lives accidentally. The substance was also used in watchmaking, and this is where the eponymous radium girls come into the story. Unfortunately for the people of that time, they didn't have fancy miniature lighting technology like LEDs, so to make watches usable at night, the dials would be painted with a compound made with a tiny amount of radium-226. It was exorbitantly expensive material to work with, because even though the element occurs naturally, it was both rare and needed to be extracted from radium chloride, which is found in the ground. Dial painting was a job performed almost exclusively by women during this time, for companies like the U.S. Radium Corporation USRC, and Radium Dial. Those very watches would be used all across the United States, especially by soldiers in both world wars, to allow them an accurate reading of the time even at night, allowing for more precision in planning and intelligence gathering. However, between the early 1920s through the 1930s, the dial painters at these firms began falling ill and later dying for seemingly mysterious causes. They had no idea what to make of these illnesses, in no small part due to the efforts of the radium firms in covering up any evidence that the substance was deadly, up to and including hiring fake doctors to give clean bills of health, faking scientific studies, corpse mutilation, and much, much more. But now I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's back up. Though some of the dial painters eventually won a drawn-out lawsuit against their employers and earned just financial reparations for the years of negligence and downright malicious treatment, as well as protections for workers of the future, the companies not only still endured, but their executives faced no criminal charges for their actions. It was a victory for the painters, but a somewhat pyrrhic victory for the labor force at large, and the entire situation would serve as a template for large companies to take advantage of the justice system and lack of oversight in the decades to come. Just look at more recent events, like the Purdue Pharma-engineered opioid crisis or the subprime mortgage crisis of 08. You'll often hear libertarians and other small government advocates rail against oppressive regulations and how they actually strangled the economy without providing the benefits touted by the regulatory bodies. They argue that in a truly free market, these companies will just regulate themselves if left to their own devices by some force of competition. The dial painters are both a dramatic yet very real example of why that just isn't true. But before we understand their story, we need to understand the mechanics of what happened to them. Maybe it's just because of my background, or maybe it's because the 5G conspiracy that spread like wildfire a few years ago absolutely drove me up a fucking wall. Either way, I think it's important for the Radium Girl's story to explain exactly what radiation poisoning is and why it's so deadly. It really puts into perspective some of the truly evil actions of the companies involved. I'll try to keep it at a high school level. To start with, radiation is a process that occurs when an element is unstable. Radium really doesn't like being radium, so eventually it will just stop doing that. Ain't that a mood? Most elements found in nature are relatively stable, though. 
Only a few naturally occurring elements, like uranium and radium, are unstable in human timescales. Over time, they decay into smaller, more stable elements. Some can decay slowly, taking thousands of years to completely disappear, while others decay in fractions of a fraction of a second. The decay is a problem for humans, though, because it gives off lots of byproducts, specifically three types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. There's actually more than just these three, but it's not really necessary for this discussion. Each of them pose a similar danger, though, through different means. Alpha particles are basically just helium atoms without their electrons, and beta particles are just free electrons. Both can be stopped by clothing and don't pose as large of a danger externally. However, they are highly dangerous if their source is ingested. Gamma rays are simply just very high-energy light, beyond the visible spectrum, that can pass through just about anything save for feet of concrete or inches of solid lead. They can completely pass through the entire human body like tissue paper, and so are just as dangerous externally. The reason these byproducts are a problem is that when they enter the human body, they can literally knock off electrons from atoms that make up cells. When an atom gains or loses an electron, we call it an ion. Thus, this process is called ionizing radiation. It's especially dangerous when they hit electrons in DNA. Knocking off even a few from the tiny base pairs of DNA can trigger major damage to the strand. If the person is lucky, the affected cell will trigger apoptosis, aka unalive itself. If they aren't, the damaged DNA can cause the cell to mutate out of control, resulting in cancer. If they are monumentally unfortunate and ingest the source of radiation, it will continually kill off cells as well as causing cancer growths, leading to necrosis or death of large swaths of tissue. Radiation like 5G or even microwaves are non-ionizing because they simply don't have enough energy to knock off these electrons, so it's impossible for them to damage DNA, impossible for them to cause cancer, Though heavy microwave exposure can cause water molecules in your cells to vibrate and heat up, killing you, so, you know, don't stick your hand in a microwave. It's important to note that everybody gets exposed to radiation. It's impossible for anyone to avoid getting exposed to at least a little bit, as the Earth is constantly being bombarded from sources in space, and you'll also get a bit from dental x-rays and even food like bananas. However, in general, none of these sources are enough to do any damage in anything but extremely strange or rare situations. This is because the damage is cumulative. It adds up over time and only becomes dangerous when in close proximity or in contact with radioactive sources on a regular basis over a long period of time, like when painting dials with radium, for instance. DNA is a very small target, meaning it takes a lot of random shots to score a hit. So while modifying a few base pairs of DNA can be catastrophic, it's highly unlikely to happen except in cases of prolonged exposure, so you probably don't have to worry. Anyways, knowing all of this, imagine swallowing a particularly radioactive source like radium, a material that emits all three types of radiation throughout your body, all day, every day, for years on end until long after you're dead and buried in the ground. Imagine that, and you might start to understand the problems that the radium girls faced. Grace Fryer, one of the New Jersey dial painters that we'll be discussing shortly, said it pretty succinctly. When I first found out what I had and learned it was incurable, I was horror-stricken. I would look at people I knew and I would say to myself, well, I'll never see you again. In 1915, Dr. Sabine Sahaski developed a luminous glow-in-the-dark paint made from a mixture of a pinch of radium and zinc sulfide. This paint produced a small amount of light with a long operating life and no power input required. He called the product Undark. In 1917, when relatively large-scale mining and refinement of radium became possible, his company, the U.S. Radium Corporation, began working with watch manufacturers to produce luminous dials for various models of timepieces. Now, it's important to put this time into context, because although we now know the dangerous effects of radium on the human body, it was not so clear-cut at the time. Radiation from X-ray sources had been shown to be dangerous, causing cancer in lab rats, though this was mostly a scientific curiosity and not something widely known. The high-profile death of Marie Curie caused by her own research into the material was nearly two decades away. To the general public, even including most doctors and government officials, radium wasn't just not dangerous, it was a beneficial substance. This cannot be stressed enough. 
However, and this is a big one, the general public does not include everyone. In particular, Dr. Von Sahosky, who himself trained with the Curies, did know how dangerous radium and the radiation it emitted was, as evidenced by protections given to the male lab workers. At one point, in a rare visit to the New Jersey dial painter studio, he witnessed a dial painter using the lip pointing method. Perhaps he had a moment of clarity or guilt, who knows. But whatever the reason, he told the girl not to do that, that it would make her sick. But he didn't elaborate on why. And when the employee brought the warning to management, they assured her that nothing could be further from the truth. After all, radium is a miracle substance. Anyways, the Roaring Twenties were right around the corner. This point in history was well before women had secured equal rights for themselves, just a few years before they could even vote in the US. However, the suffrage movement had significant momentum. Thus, women began to secure jobs more often at younger ages. It was most common for young women to work until they found husbands. Lesbians didn't exist back then, silly after which they would quit to take care of the house and children. In the 1920s, average wages for women, even adjusted for inflation, were pretty low, at just over 25 cents or $4.30 an hour, versus 40 cents or $6.90 an hour for men. Pretty ridiculous that, adjusted for inflation, the minimum wage is barely more than that today, but I digress. So considering that women could make as much as 47 cents or $8.10 per hour, calculated using 250 dials per day over the course of eight hours times 1.5 cents per dial, combined with the glamour of this sexy new substance that could make them glow like angels, you can probably understand why these women were so eager to work as a dial painter. Von Sahosky's U.S. Radium, based in New Jersey, was not the only company to create luminous paint for watches. Others, like Radium Dial in Illinois and Cold Light Manufacturing Company, were employing very similar practices at the time. Remember this, as it will become important later. It wasn't just one company or one executive. These dial painters, flush with cash, often for the first time in their lives, took full advantage of their newfound wealth. They would buy expensive clothes, accessories, and other luxury goods, and spend time enjoying the nightlife. It's important to note that many of them were still teens, many as young as 15, 60, some even younger. Many of them were, in fact, girls. At work, they were given brushes with camel hair bristles that would often spread out too wide to paint the small dials to the precise degree demanded by company leadership. Thus, they were taught to put a point on the brush the best way their seniors knew how. Put the brush into their mouths, squeeze it between their lips, and pull out. This process was called lip pointing, and virtually all of the dial painters were told to use the method. I just want to repeat that. All of the dial painters, at least at US Radium and Radium Dial, two completely separate entities, were taught to put the radium-contaminated brush into their mouths up to 100 times per day or more by their superiors. Even if they washed the brush off in clean water before pointing, trace amounts of radium would still be ingested. But US radium didn't even give that much of a shit. Instead, they'd provide the girls a cup of water to wash it off in, the same cup of radium contaminated water over and over again. This method wouldn't change for over 10 years, even after it became abundantly clear the damage it was doing. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself a bit. The girls were repeatedly told that the paint was completely safe to handle. Reportedly, one of the new employee trainers would often demonstrate the safety by licking and eating the paint off of a spatula. So convinced were they of radium safety and beneficial properties that some of the girls working for Radium Dial would use leftover paint to play with, as makeup or to draw mustaches on each other. Now, for the most part, I'm not focusing on the individuals here as I'm taking more of a bird's eye view at what happened and its fallout. Pun intended. Sorry, I have to inject some sort of levity or this shit is gonna be a real drag to watch. However, if you wanna get a more individual focused story, you should check out the book Radium Girl. It served as both inspiration and an invaluable source of information for this video. I've included links to this and all my other sources in the video description. Many of the girls, who again really just were girls at the time they started, made some pretty monumental efforts to right the wrongs committed against them. Women like Catherine Donahue, Grace Fryer, Quinta McDonald, Hazel Vincent, Catherine Schaub, who all fought for justice, as well as the ones who passed away before getting the chance, all deserve to be remembered. So if you want more information about them specifically, I highly recommend the book.
As I mentioned, these companies were, at the same time, equipping the lab staff with protective gear while encouraging the girls to just raw dog radium in their mouths. Why? Why would the company have two contradictory policies like this? So this is where I put in my own opinion. I, I don't think the people running the companies were some mustache-twirling cartoon villains. I mean, clearly they did some evil things, don't get me wrong, but to claim that the motivation for these actions was just inherent evil is a simplistic view, in my opinion especially when multiple separate companies were doing the exact same thing. One thing to note is that early on, it probably wasn't clear to anyone, even the executives at the companies, that the girls were in actual danger. Very, very few people knew the horrors of cumulative radiation poisoning. It was believed that the tiny doses involved in the luminous paint weren't dangerous if handled properly. That's just a result of the newness of radium research. So again, if they weren't just inherently evil people, then why? Incentive. One, the production of radium products had very little oversight by any regulatory bodies, as such things didn't really exist at the time in the same way they do today. Workers' compensation was still very new and had a very limited list of covered harms, so companies had virtual carte blanche to do as they saw fit. And two, it was cheaper and more effective to let the dial painters lip point as opposed to researching and developing a safer alternative. So they just didn't. Actually, Radium Dial did later on develop a glass rod to replace the camel brush, but only enforced its use until they saw it causing a dip in their bottom line. It doesn't take Adolf Hitler to commit evil deeds. It just takes people that value the dollar over human life. Anyways, it wasn't long until the first signs of radiation sickness showed itself in the early dial painters at US Radium in New Jersey. Many of the girls first noticed problems with their teeth and gums. Now, I buried the lead a little bit earlier. About 80% of the radium that the girls ingested was passed via waste. But the other 20% didn't just sit where it was and passively cause damage. Instead, the human body basically mistakes it for calcium. So the substance traveled through the body via the digestive system and had a nasty proclivity to embed itself in bone all along the way. And since the point of entry was the mouth, it often wound up in the teeth and jaw specifically. Innocently enough, the girls would go into the dentist for a simple ache and get the offending tooth pulled. Unfortunately, this only exacerbated the problem, and they would end up returning repeatedly until their mouths were near empty, not just of teeth, but in some cases, their entire lower jaw. In fact, in one instance, a dentist simply touched the girl's jawbone during an examination and it just fell out. Her jawbone fell directly out of her mouth. The first dial painter to die from radiation poisoning was in 1922, yet her death certificate listed the cause as syphilis. The company was warned multiple times throughout the early 20s by different parties that radium posed a danger to the employees and were suggested policies to mitigate it. As early as 1923, they were given a notice by the New Jersey Department of Labor saying, I would suggest that every operator be warned by a printed leaflet of the dangers of getting this material on the skin or into the system, especially the mouth, and that they be forced to use the utmost cleanliness. By 1924, U.S. Radium absolutely knew that something was awry as they hired an independent scientist husband and wife team, the Drinkers, to complete a study on the safety of the radium paint. The result was the Drinker Report, and it unequivocally stated that the radium was indeed the cause for the declining health of the dial painters. Now, given what you know, what do you think the good people of US Radium did with that information? Did they A, immediately cease the use of undark paint until its safety could be further tested? B, in the practice of lip pointing and provide the girls the same safety gear afforded to the lab team of men? C, at the very f***ing least, hire another independent scientist to check out the drinker's conclusions, or D, refuse to publish the drinker report, cover it up, and instead forge a completely contradictory conclusion, use the weight of the drinker's name to assuage their employees' suspicions, and even threaten to sue when the drinkers tried to make their own report public. I think the answer is obvious. I mean, there probably wouldn't be a video otherwise. This is not speculation. It was proven in court and alone should have gotten the people in charge to face some sort of gross criminal negligence charges. If there was any doubt that the company knew they were training employees in a deadly work practice, that time had passed. But they weren't done yet. Not by a mile. 
While there were suspicions that the dial painter's sickness originated from their place of employment in the early 1920s, most doctors were baffled by the condition of their patients and attributed the symptoms to other known diseases. For example, the strange phenomena of pulling infected teeth, resulting in more infected teeth, appeared to be caused by phosphorus poisoning, something they termed fossy jaw. Phosphorus, unlike radium, was a well-known industrial hazard at the time. One of the dentists even visited the U.S. radium studio to investigate whether they used any phosphorus in their paint, but was assured that that was not the case. That part was true, but just because tigers can't also carry machine guns doesn't make them safe. But could you imagine? Meanwhile, the dial painter's health continued to degrade. What happened to them was absolutely horrific. There's no other way to say it. Some of the women walked with limps while they were able to walk at all, as the radium had quite literally eaten away their leg bones, sometimes causing one leg to be multiple inches shorter than the other. In addition to the issues with the teeth and jaw falling out, many also suffered through having their mouths literally covered in bleeding, oozing sores. One girl's mouth, near the end, was described as one giant abscess. Others developed extremely stiff joints that made the doctors suspect early-onset arthritis. Again, many of these girls were in their late teens or early 20s. But it wasn't just that. Of course, because of the radiation, cancers like leukemia were not uncommon, in addition to anemia, menstruation problems, sterility, just to name a few. Basically, the dial painters were absolutely riddled with some of the worst diseases and deformations imaginable. Another girl, who didn't even work in the studio, died from radiation poisoning just from sleeping next to her dial painter sister in bed every night. Much later, when the workers from Radium Dial Corporation in Illinois became ill, one of the women reported waking up at night and catching a glimpse of herself in the mirror. Though she was in complete darkness, she was able to make a ghostly green outline of her skeleton glowing through her skin. You seriously can't make this shit up. That's like cartoon level bad. It wouldn't be inaccurate to say that the dial painter's bodies were simply breaking down, rotting around them, and there was absolutely nothing anyone could do to stop it. As I said though, US radium was not done. Some of the girls were visited by a Dr. Friedrich Flynn, who claimed to be an independent party, referred to them by a friend. He examined the girls and gave each and every one of them either a clean bill of health or told them that their maladies could just be attributed to run-of-the-mill anemia. Just get some more iron in your diet, gals. As you may have guessed, Dr. Flynn was not actually an independent consultant. He was, in fact, being paid by US Radium to visit the dial painters and really just get them to stop their whining. What you might not have guessed, though, is that Dr. Flynn wasn't even an actual medical doctor at all. He instead had a PhD in philosophy. As Kate Moore said, the jokes write themselves. U.S. Radium was absolutely aware of this. They simply couldn't find a real doctor to tell them what they wanted to hear, so they just got someone, anyone, with an air of authority and zero integrity to do it. I find it very funny in a dark way that the headline on Flynn's obituary in the New York Times listed him as a, quote, expert on radiation poisoning. Expert in covering it up, perhaps. By 1925, the Consumers League, a non-governmental advocacy group for workers' rights, became involved in the case. Catherine Wiley of the Consumer League brought in a statistician and workers' health expert, Alice Hamilton. Together, they launched the second main investigation into U.S. radium and specifically the working conditions of the dial painters. Dr. Hamilton was also in contact with Catherine Drinker. There's like four or five different Catherines in this story, kind of hard to keep them all straight. She made the drinkers aware that U.S. radium had been misrepresenting their study, lying to their workers in the drinker name. This finally got Cecil Drinker, the husband, to act and publish his report, ignoring the mewling lawsuit threats from U.S. radium. Quite a bit of progress was made in producing evidence for the dial painter's case in 25. An independent statistician named Dr. Friedrich Hoffman was one of the first scientists outside the drinkers to acknowledge the link between the radium and the dial painter's condition. He even put a name on the new disease, radium necrosis. He presented his findings to the American Medical Association that year. Unfortunately for the girls at US Radium and Radium Dial, they didn't learn about the report and it changed nothing about the conditions in the studio. That same year, though, Dr. Harrison Martland, the county medical examiner in Essex, New Jersey, where the U.S. radium plant was located, developed a posthumous test for radium poisoning. He dug up and exhumed the body of one Molly Magia, the girl who, according to her death certificate, supposedly died of syphilis. 
The only way he could determine the presence of the radium in the bones was to remove them from the corpse and burn them to ash for testing. Of note is the fact that Martland didn't initially get involved because of the dial painter's case. Instead, it was the death of a male chemist at the US radium plant that got the wheels turning. That's not an indictment on Martland's character, by the way, as he staunchly backed up the girls' claims and helped immensely in their crusade for justice. It's just a fact indicative of the time. Interestingly, Dr. Von Sahosky, who had been ousted as CEO of the company in the years prior, helped Martland conduct the studies. Perhaps he felt guilty for allowing such a dangerous practice such as lip pointing to go on unimpeded. Together, Martland and Von Sahosky created a primitive Geiger counter to test the girl's breath for radioactive radon. Indeed, each girl they tested was measured to be highly radioactive. Von Sahosky himself took the test for fun, and his own levels were off the charts. Over 20,000. At this point in time, it was pretty clear to the dial painters that despite all of US radium's claims and obfuscations, undark paint was, in fact, the source of their deteriorating health. Thus, in 1927, five of the former dial painters, Grace Fryer, Catherine Schaub, Quinta McDonald, Albina Larisse, and Edna Hussman, all filed suit against their US radium company with the help of a young lawyer named Raymond Berry. Theirs was not the first of such attempts. Previously, there had been many smaller scale suits, but they all inevitably failed for various reasons. As I said, since workers' compensation laws were still very new at that time, the list of compensable diseases was not comprehensive, and since radium was not widely known to be a safety hazard, radium poisoning was not on that list. In fact, prior to their own suit, Grace Fryer and the others campaigned to add radium necrosis to the compensable diseases list, and had a suspiciously easy time getting the law passed. It turned out that the final law ended up being non-retroactive, meaning that nobody who had been afflicted prior to 1926 could file claims under it. Besides it being non-retroactive, though, it also only covered specifically jaw necrosis, ignoring all of the other myriad complications caused from ingesting radium. More insidious, however, was the fact that it was simply adding to the existing compensation law, which had a five-month statute of limitations from the time of injury. The problem with that, of course, being that radiation poisoning is a slow, cumulative process, as we said. Many of the girls only began developing serious symptoms years after starting, not months, often after leaving the company for other opportunities. So it's pretty clear why US Radium put up almost no fight against it. They could, on the one hand, say they were championing worker safety, but the way the law was written, nobody would ever be able to use it to gain compensation. So, in the suit that the girls filed, their lawyer, Raymond Berry, argued common sense. He argued that, of course, the girls could not have possibly filed a claim for compensation within five months, as the law says. That they could only have done so once given an actual diagnosis from a doctor, which recognized the dangers of radium. I'm not going to get too deep into the specifics of the case here. Again, I would suggest checking out Kate Moore's book for more details. Regardless, in 1927, the case of the five dial painters from New Jersey began. Grace Fryer herself asked for $250,000 in compensation, or nearly $4.4 million in 2023 dollars. In response to the suit, US Radium employed all sorts of underhanded, despicable tactics, claiming that the dial painters were involved in a conspiracy to tank the company, or even stating in reply to the suit that the girls were, quote, guilty of contributory negligence in failing to exercise due care and precaution for their safety. Basically, it was their own fault for listening to their superiors and not having precognitive information about radium's dangers before even the doctors examining them. A libertarian-minded argument, if I'd ever heard one. They also attacked Raymond Berry by publicly demeaning him and threatening to bring up charges against the New Jersey Bar Association. Now, I want to sidetrack here and briefly mention Dr. Elizabeth Hughes. Hughes worked as a physicist for US Radium for a time before resigning from the company in 1922, doing consultant work for them up until 27. Her big contribution was a special type of electroscope, a device that normally measures the relative amount and type of charge on an object. Hers, however, measured the amount of gamma radiation being emitted from radium. In 1927, Hughes agreed to testify as an expert witness for the girls on the dangers of radium and their contamination. 
She exhumed the body of Molly Magia, confirming Dr. Martland's earlier conclusion that her bones were indeed radioactive. She also used a different type of electroscope to measure the breadth of the five dial painters involved in the lawsuit, finding each one of them to be extremely radioactive, again confirming Martland's own tests. Yet, when she testified on her findings, USRC's lawyer predictably attacked her credibility, pointing out that she was, at the time, an unemployed housewife. Luckily, the judge dismissed this outright. Ironic that the company would claim that Hughes was not a credible expert when they themselves employed her and then paid her for her consultory services for years after she left. But who am I to judge? By the time of the first court appearance in January of 1928, Two of the women, for they were women at this point, years after their employment at U.S. Radium, were too ill to even attend the hearing. The lead plaintiff, Grace Fryer, did appear in court despite missing all of her teeth, unable to walk, and requiring a back brace to sit upright. Each of them were deteriorating rapidly at this point. The judge on the case seemed sympathetic to the girls. Yet despite that, a second hearing was scheduled over three months out in April of that year. By that time, however, none of the girls were healthy enough to attend. Yet, U.S. Radium was not done with their shady practices. They were seemingly doing everything they could to stall the case in the hopes that the girls would simply die off before any judgment could be made. In this case, they requested that the hearing be postponed again until September, as many of the company's executives were vacationing in Europe at the time. So I'm going to lay my cards on the table. I clearly have an opinion here. I'm totally on the side of the workers, of the dial painters, and I think that history agrees with me. Despite that, I've tried to keep my commentary to a minimum as the facts speak for themselves. However, I just, this is absolutely disgusting. Stalling for the deaths of your previous employees by conveniently taking a vacation to Europe, something that the dial painters would probably never be able to do because of the way those very people ran their business, paying for it with literal blood money, this story is filled to the brim with disgusting actions, but this definitely is up there as one of the worst. Luckily for the girls, they had a friend in the media, the celebrity journalist Walter Lippmann. He had been writing about the case and in doing so captured the attention of the nation. Upon hearing about this latest delay tactic, the national outrage at USRC pressured them into agreeing to an earlier date in June. However, that final hearing was not to be. The girls settled out of court each agreeing to take a one-time payment of $10,000 and $600 per year, or around 180 k and 10 k in today's dollars, as well as covering all medical expenses. The stipulations were that they not hold U.S. radium liable for their condition, and that they were to be examined by a committee of five doctors, two chosen by either party and one supposed to be impartial. If anyone thought the fight was over for the girls, though, they were sorely mistaken. The company doctors continuously poked and prodded at the girls, looking for any inconsistencies in their claims to free the company of financial obligation. The company itself, meanwhile, fought and quibbled against every bill. They clearly didn't expect the girls to last more than a few months when they agreed to the settlement. Now, I don't think any of us can really blame the women for taking the deal. By this point, all of them were up to their necks in medical bills, needing basically round-the-clock care. I cannot imagine the physical and mental toll it took on both them and their families. The peace of mind the settlement provided them was probably too much to pass up. Regardless, U.S. Radium was basically able to wash their hands of any wrongdoing and go about business as usual. Unsurprisingly, given the state of the women in June 1928, very few of the $600 annual payments were ever collected. By the end of 1930, two years later, all five of the women on the lawsuit had died. Following the trial, the U.S. Radium president, still unwilling to accept any sort of responsibility for the lives lost, stated, We unfortunately gave work to a great many people who were physically unfit to procure employment in other lines of industry. Cripples and persons similarly incapacitated were engaged. What was then considered an act of kindness on our part has since been turned against us. An act of kindness. Good God, they had absolutely no shame. Now, it would be disingenuous of me to claim that U.S. Radium came out of this situation totally unscathed, and I'm not. But I'd ask you to hold any comments about this as we'll be discussing the aftermath of the case here in a bit. But first, I want to talk about the dial painters from a different company, Radium Dial in Illinois.
The Radium Dial Company was started in 1917 by Joseph Kelly, just a few years after U.S. Radium itself. They competed in much of the same market as their competitor, though their reach wasn't quite so broad. After moving studios around Illinois for the first few years, the company settled in a former high school in Ottawa, Illinois. By this time, of course, some of the girls in New Jersey had already begun falling ill to the luminous paint, which was largely the same formula being used by Radium Dial, though it would be years before the girls in Illinois heard anything about it. Right from the start, Radium Dial seemed to be much more amateurish than their older competitors. The dial painters often worked at old school desks, and the allotment of luminous paint given to them was not as tightly controlled as it was in New Jersey. As a result, the girls usually ended their shifts with paint left over, and they tended to play with it much more often. The anecdote of painting mustaches and nails that I shared earlier was more prevalent in the Ottawa studio. It was also the place where the trainer habitually ate paint off the spatula as a demonstration to trainees. Despite the dial painters themselves being left in the dark to the dangers, by 1925 it was pretty clear to the leadership at Radium Dial that their paint was in fact toxic. One thing to note is that, although they claimed to be using mainly Radium-226 in the paint, it was later revealed to be substituted for the cheaper, but even more deadly, Mesothorium. It operates very similar to pure Radium, but was much more aggressive in attacking the human body. This is possibly why they were not quite so frugal with it. Either way, their use of this substance in the paint will become doubly insidious in a bit. By 1925, many of the girls in Ottawa had begun showing the same symptoms seen in New Jersey – jaw necrosis, anemia, bone fractures, and even tumors. The plant officials brought in company doctors to do unexplained routine checkups and did not disclose the results to the patients. When the girls began to question these practices and ask about the symptoms they were experiencing, the company doctors simply deflected much the same way that Dr. Flynn did, blaming their maladies on anything and everything but radium poisoning. Margaret, or Peg Looney, was one of the first Ottawa girls known to die from radiation poisoning in Illinois. According to the secret company records, she had tested positive for high levels of radioactivity as early as 1925, and her health began to deteriorate after this, showing all the hallmark signs of the disease, including radium jaw. Despite all that, she continued to work at Radium Dial through the pain, convinced by the company doctors that her illness had nothing to do with work. She passed away on August 14, 1929. That very night, men working for the Radium Dial Company came to her house unannounced to take the body away and bury it. This was obviously out of the ordinary, and the family was already suspicious of the company despite their constant reassurances over the years that Peg was completely healthy. Thus, her brother-in-law Jack stepped in, refusing their offer. The company men argued with Jack, but later left. They clearly knew that the death was caused by the radium poisoning, and they weren't done trying to cover that up. To that end, they later contacted the family again, asking if they wanted Peg's body autopsied. The family agreed, on the condition that their own family doctor be present. A time and place was agreed upon by the two parties. Again, and I can't stress this enough, the family knew that Radium Dial was going to try pulling what scientists called some ho shit, and they were absolutely right. When the family doctor showed up the next day, the company doctors had already completed the autopsy and left. He wasn't there to see the multiple fracture lines on Peg's ribs, nor the way the flat bones of her skull showed numerous thin areas and holes. He didn't examine the radium necrosis that was found very strongly in the skull vault, pelvis, and at least 16 other bones. He did not witness the widespread skeletal changes that were evident throughout Peg's battered body. He was not there to see, as the company doctor, removed by post-mortem resection, the remains of Peg Looney's jaw. The company stole her f***ing jaw. They mutilated her corpse to cover up their crimes. This was beyond negligence. This was active obstruction in the worst possible way. They wrote up the autopsy, attributing her death to diphtheria, and claiming her teeth and jaw were in excellent condition, despite the fact that she had multiple extractions in the years prior. They even managed to insert a comment into her obituary, claiming that Peg's parents were well pleased with the results of the autopsy. They were not pleased. They knew the company had killed their daughter and tricked them out of the justice they deserved. Twenty years later, she would be officially vindicated when her body was unearthed and re-examined. Even after all that time, she was found to be still highly radioactive at a level of 19,500 microcuries over a thousand times the safe levels of radiation in human bones. 
As more and more of the girls began to suffer from the poisoning, they eventually grouped together to file suit. In a case of history repeating itself, another dial painter, Inez Vallette, and her colleagues had previously attempted to get compensation from Radium Dial. However, despite being over a decade after the suit in New Jersey, the law in Illinois for workers' compensation was quite outdated. The result was that the company was able to weasel its way out of any culpability. According to Kate Moore, There was that old chestnut, the statute of limitations. Inez had filed suit years after she left Radium Dial. Her disability did not occur while she was employed. There was the fact that Radium was a poison. Injuries caused by poison were not covered by the Occupational Diseases Act. And there was the law itself. Radium Dial charged that its antiquated wording was vague, indefinite, and did not furnish an intelligible standard of conduct. And so, the first major case from the Ottawa Dial Painters was lost before it really began. Despite the fact that the company admitted in their case that their paint was poisonous, they were found to not be at fault. Store this little admission away in your head for a moment. Not a cent was awarded to the dial painters for their years of suffering, and after eight such years, Inez herself passed away horribly. A sarcoma tumor in her neck ruptured and she bled out in her home. The flesh in her neck had quite literally been eaten away by the cancer. Another woman, Catherine Donahue, who was a fellow employee at Radium Dial, began to fall ill in 1928, and by 1931, her health had deteriorated to the point where she had lost half her body weight, pieces of her jaw had fallen out, and she walked with a constant limp. A doctor in Chicago later confirmed to her that she indeed had radium poisoning. I realize I may be sounding like a broken record, constantly reiterating the same symptoms in these women. However, I think it's important to beat this radioactive drum each time to really hit home the toll that they paid for trusting their employers. After their first attempt, the state of Illinois passed the Illinois Occupational Disease Act, apparently as a response to the suit. So a year later, in 1937, the girls tried again, this time employing the pro bono services of Leonard Grossman, a famous attorney who was well known for taking up lost causes. It was a great get, as the girls were financing the case on their own dime up to that point and had very little money to pay the lawyer. Grossman had a pretty brilliant strategy. As the radium slash mesothorium ingested by the girls was a constant contaminant in their bodies, in his eyes, the statute of limitations had not lapsed, since every second of every day, it was continuously causing new damage. Bafflingly, Radium Dial's defense in the trial was to claim that radium was not, in fact, dangerous. Their lawyer, Arthur Majid, stated that, the company's position is that the women cannot recover compensation under the new section of the law because that relates only to diseases incurred from poisons as a result of occupation. And Kate Moore adds, With the firm determining radium was not a poison, they hold themselves not liable. Majid called radium poisoning a phrase that was merely a convenient method of describing the effect of radioactive substances upon the human body. A semantic argument on the definition of poisoning? That's what you're gonna go with? Sure, Jan. All this despite the fact that in a previous attempted suit, the very same lawyer had claimed the exact opposite position just a few years earlier, knowing that radium poisoning was not covered under the law at the time, prior to the Occupational Disease Act. Many things were unearthed and or confirmed in the course of the trial, including one, the fact that the company leadership indeed knew of the dangers of radiation poisonings as early as 1925 when the company doctors began their routine checkups and they kept secret records of these checkups. Two, after the settlement in New Jersey had made national headlines, the company told its workers that it wasn't radium that harmed the girls there, but instead mesothorium. They also released a full page advertisement stating in no uncertain terms that their company only used pure radium. So since radium dial only used radium, not mesothorium, the dial painters were in no danger. Not true, but also. Three, radium dial themselves had been using mesothorium in their own paint for several years. And four, the best possible outcome of the lawsuit for the women was a $10,000 bond. That's 218 k in today's dollars. While that might seem like a decent amount, the sum was to be split between all of the girls involved in the suit. Recall again that each of them had been suffering for years, paying for doctors, dentists, and the like throughout the whole thing, and would continue to need those things going forward. That last point is particularly unjust. Grossman spent months scrounging for company assets to go after in the suit, but the $10,000 bond was the only thing he was able to scrounge up. 
It was a paltry sum, especially for such a large company. The reason was that Radium Dial had all but fled the state of Illinois, moving their operations to New York under a different name. Meanwhile, the company's former president and founder, Joseph Kelly, had been ousted in 1934 and later set up a near-identically run studio called Luminous Processes, right down the street in Ottawa, hiring many of the same girls who had worked at Radium Dial and employing the same practices that had gotten many of them so ill in the first place. Unfortunately for the Ottawa Dial Painters, the state had no jurisdiction to go after either Kelly's supposedly separate operation, nor could it reach across state lines and go after the assets of the new Radium Dial, now located in New York. And so, all they were left with was the $10,000 bond. Yet, the trial pressed on. Catherine Donahue took the stand at one point, being subjected to grueling testimony. She brought a box with her to the stand, from which she pulled out the small pieces of her jaw that had fallen out. Later, a doctor was asked, mid-trial, whether her prognosis was fatal. He confirmed this in front of her, stating that she had, at most, months to live. Upon hearing this, Catherine fell into uncontrollable sobs and had to leave the courtroom. She would not return. Instead, the case was concluded in Catherine's home, as she was no longer well enough to leave her bed. In their living room, the judge eventually ruled in favor of the dial painters. Yet, their victory came at great personal cost, and I'm not talking about the obvious financial one. One thing I left out of their story here was the general ostracization from their own town that the dial painters struggled through as they sought justice. Recall that the events of the lawsuit in Illinois were happening in the 1930s, at the height of the Great Depression. Radium Dial was a large employer, one of the few still offering well-paying jobs at the time in Ottawa. And of course, as everyone knew at the time, Radium was totally safe. So when the ball started rolling on the case, they were shunned by nearly everyone in their own community. Family, friends, clergymen. They were seen as going after a perfectly respectable company for their own delusions or greed or any other number of seemingly selfish reasons. The women were on their own side, by themselves, save for their spouses and grossmen, for all those years. They knew the truth, that something was wrong, even when the entire world around them was telling them otherwise. Yet despite it all, despite all their hardships, despite the unfairness of their settlement, the girls did win their case. That in itself was a minor miracle, and its effects would be felt for decades to come. Despite the dial painters largely getting shafted in terms of personal compensation, especially those in Ottawa, their cause did not go unnoticed by the public. Thanks in part to the media coverage of their trials, the Radium Girls became known nationwide, and public outcry made sure their story didn't die. The cause was also championed by the surviving women. Unlike the New Jersey painters, a few of the Ottawans lived well past the trial. One such, Mae Keen, lived to a ripe old age of 107. She was one of the few that quit the job early, and thus likely wasn't exposed to near the same levels of radiation. As a direct result of these efforts, subsequent dial painters in most factories would eventually be provided with safety equipment, the same that their predominantly male lab counterparts had enjoyed all those years. Dial painting firms of the 1920s had modeled their operations on artist studios and involved fairly casual management of workers, but the model factory in 1943 patterned itself after a tightly supervised laboratory. Dial painters labored at individual booths, each equipped with ventilation systems, and engineers and inspectors regulated their attire, work routines, and hygiene. At hiring, and twice each year thereafter, workers received physical examinations and tests for radioactivity. If company doctors found them likely candidates for radium poisoning, or if tests showed that they retained more than one-tenth of a microgram of radiation, it was general policy to dismiss dial painters or to rotate them to less dangerous jobs. In 1949, thanks in no small part to the Radium Girls cases, U.S. Congress passed a federal law making all workplace-originating diseases compensable and extended the statute of limitations, making for much more sensible coverage for workers. The loopholes that USRC and Radium Dial exploited would no longer be an issue. They were also responsible for the creation of OSHA, the government body dedicated to the protection of civilians in the workforce to this day. Though the number of dial painters saved by those extended protections are unknown, we do know that approximately 4,000 women and men worked for U.S. Radium alone in the decades since, and they likely have the Radium Girls to thank for their good health. However, their legacy had much more far-reaching effects on workplace and general radiation safety. 
Thousands of studies were conducted in the following decades on both the living and deceased dial painters to better understand the effects of radiation on the human body. These studies would be used to progress fields of medicine in treating cancers and other diseases. In addition, the Manhattan Project used the girls' experience to inform their precautions when working with radioactive substances, and while their work ended in the unjust deaths of many innocent people, many more would have died were the stories of the dial painters not taken seriously said a member of the Atomic Energy Commission. If it hadn't been for those dial painters, the Manhattan Project's management could have reasonably rejected the extreme precautions that were urged on it. And thousands of workers might well have been and might still be in great danger. They used the information gleaned from the dial painters' experience to both protect the scientists working on the project, but also civilians. Early on, the effects of nuclear weapons testing was not well understood. But scientists knew that strontium-90, a byproduct of such tests, acted similarly to radium when deposited in human tissue. Thus, the girls became invaluable not only to science, but to the American populace as a whole, as their experience eventually stopped nuclear tests conducted anywhere near a populated area, constrained to underground or at-sea tests. The sum total of the Radium Girls' contributions to the relatively safe society as we know it today is nigh impossible to calculate. Yet despite all of these victories won, the parties responsible, the leaders of the companies who inflicted all this suffering on the women, would never be brought to justice. At the end of the day, it took such unstoppable tidal waves as the will of a nation and federal intervention to finally make these companies care enough for their workers to provide simple, straightforward protections. And it would be a mistake to ignore these lessons. The dark secret about these radium companies is that, despite having to pay out relatively small sums to the workers they negligently put and knowingly kept in harm's way for years, nobody in the leadership was ever brought to justice for their actions. I want you to think about everything we've heard thus far, and try to imagine a world where any one of these actions, let alone their collective, wouldn't end up with you or I sitting in prison. Hiring fake doctors to give fake consultations, refusing patients their medical records, intentionally covering up reports of safety issues, fraudulently misrepresenting those reports. Corpse mutilation. Each of these, when enacted by a single individual, would likely result in hefty legal consequences. However, because these executives were able to hide behind a thin veil of deniability and corporate liability, they were able to get away with all of it. One such person was Dr. Friedrich Flynn, who again was not a medical doctor. He was an assistant professor of physiology. Yet both he and USRC would obfuscate this fact for years until he was finally found out during the trial preparation for the New Jersey painters. Previously, he had been hired by a different company to show that leaded gas was completely safe. It isn't. The company knew that. Friedrich knew that. It's why all the gas stations you visit in the US specifically say unleaded. One thing I didn't mention about Flynn was his work in Connecticut. USRC had set up a studio there for the Waterbury Clock Company, and a good doctor had basically free reign over the employees. Flynn repeatedly lied through his teeth, says Kate Moore in her book, telling the women over and over that they contained no traces of radium. Many of them later, of course, would die while suffering from symptoms consistent with radium poisoning. Unfortunately, none of them were able to win out in any lawsuits. While there, he wrote bogus studies to give the company an air of scientific authority, claiming in one that an industrial hazard does not exist in the painting of luminous dials. This was in 1926, well after the Drinker Report, well after Hoffman's own report and Martland's first studies on Molly Magia, well after many of the women had already fallen ill and died. The founder of USRC and the creator of Undark Paint, Dr. Von Sahosky, who himself was aware of the dangers posed by radium poisoning, possibly before anyone else in the industry outside the Curies themselves, and who personally admitted to this knowledge with his offhand warning to Grace Fryer, was also not held to account for his role in the deaths of his employees. Prior to the trial in New Jersey, he worked with the girl's attorney and the scientists trying to measure their radioactivity, perhaps in a moment of clarity and guilt for the suffering he had caused. Though during the trial, he recanted it all and turned against the girl's cause. In the end, he too died from radiation poisoning later in 1928. 
Arthur Roeder, the man who took the helm of USRC after ousting von Sahoski, the man who forged a false press release based on the Drinker Report, the man who continuously claimed that radium was in no way toxic to its workers, despite the Drinkers, Dr. Martlands, and other scientists' numerous warnings, never faced so much as an indictment. Yet another to fall through the cracks of justice was Joseph Kelly, the former president of Radium Dial. He was the head of the company during the time when they were committing the most egregious acts discussed here, including the mutilation of Peg Looney's corpse and the secret radiation tests conducted on the girls. Despite all that, he was simply allowed to create a copycat business just a few blocks away from his former company. This new company, called Luminous Processes, was a near-identical twin to Radium Dial. It inherited not only the leadership, but many of the same girls and practices. All of this was just allowed to happen because of it being technically a separate entity under a new name. Imagine if you could just get out of murder charges by changing your name to John Doe. Luminous Processes didn't just survive the Radium Dial lawsuit. By all accounts, it thrived all the way up to 1976, when it was finally shut down by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because the plant was found to have radiation levels almost 1,700 times the recommended safe levels. The building itself was an ecological and public health disaster area. Despite the safeguards and regulations put in place in the decades following the Radium Girls' lawsuits, Luminous Processes was described to be a death factory. They had stopped the practice of lip pointing after the suit, but also stopped short of providing any further adequate protection. When the plant was finally shut down, some of the former employees spoke to a journalist. They were told that eliminating lip pointing had ended earlier problems. They worked in unvented rooms. They wore smocks that they laundered at home. Geiger counters could pick up readings from pants returned from a dry cleaner and from clothes stored away in a cedar chest. However, once again, Kelly and his new company were able to weasel their way out of paying claims by shifting assets into other holdings, in much the same way as Radium Dial had done in the 30s. The same was true for the actual Radium Dial company, which, as I said, fled to New York, as well as the original USRC plant in New Jersey. All the others not discussed here were designated Superfund sites between the 70s and 90s. They each required heavy government investment in order to clean up the nuclear waste, which was found to be, again, hundreds of times the recommended background. The businesses themselves somehow were allowed to survive post-lawsuits and operated for decades to come, save for the exception of the original radium dial, which didn't last as long. Some of these would adopt the stringent guidelines set forth by Congress in 1949 and switch over to less toxic substitutes, such as tritium, a heavier isotope of hydrogen. However, as discussed, others like luminous processes continued to make dials using the same radium formula up until their shutdown. USRC would eventually be rebranded as the Safety Light Corporation following the Second World War, and it continued to operate up until they went defunct in 2007. In the 90s, when their studio in New Jersey was declared a Superfund site, Kate Moore says, Almost 750 homes had been built on top of that waste. They too needed decontamination. More than 200 acres of land were affected in Orange, New Jersey, some to a depth of more than 15 feet. The EPA ordered the corporate successor of USRC, Safety Light, to perform the cleanup work, but it declined, except for agreeing to erect a new security fence. Even this they did not see through, the EPA was forced to complete it. The courts were not forgiving. In 1991, the New Jersey Supreme Court found the USRC forever liable for the contamination and declared the firm had had constructive knowledge about the dangers at the time it operated there. Residents sued the firm. After seven years, the cases were eventually settled out of court, costing the company some $14.2 million over 30 million in damages. It reportedly cost the government 144 million, 332 million to clean up radium contaminated sites across New Jersey and New York. It's hard to fathom all of the damage inflicted on the environment, the harsh financial burden on the families forced to move from their radiation contaminated homes, all of the sickness and death caused by the company both within and without. Accurate numbers for these things will almost never be completely whole. Yet, despite all of that, as we've seen, nobody from any of these companies' leadership were ever held to account. Somehow, that is justice. Somehow, all of that is our legal system working as intended.
I wish this were the part where I could wrap everything up in a bow by saying everything's better now, that this sort of corporate malfeasance is no longer possible, that there are safeguards in place to ensure that companies can't get away with treating their employees like disposable tools. But I think we all know how hollow that would ring. It's why the Radium Girl story is still so prescient and relevant even a century later. In 2008, the subprime mortgage market collapsed because the big banks, rating agencies, and everyone else involved in the chain of fraud chose profit over integrity. It was in their incentive to do so, at least in the short term, just as the practice of lip-pointing radium-tipped brushes was for USRC and radium dial in the 20s and 30s. While events like the so-called Great Recession may have not been as dramatic as women fighting for justice in a courtroom while their bodies were literally disintegrating, while the causality may not have been as straightforward as a company poisoning its employees, the effects of these modern-day disasters are even farther reaching and no less deadly. For example, the nearly 260,000 excess cancer deaths between 2008 and 2010 linked to the recession, as reported by Harvard. Higher unemployment due to economic crisis and austerity measures is associated with a higher number of cancer deaths. Universal health coverage protects against these deaths. That there are needless deaths is a major societal concern. Add to that the estimated 5,000 excess suicide deaths as an indirect result of the same reasons, particularly loss of employment, and non-fatal but no less damaging were the nearly 9 million jobs lost, and that's what I was able to turn up in just a few minutes of research. Who knows how far and wide the sum total of the damage of that catastrophe went. So no, unfortunately these types of events still happen to this day. We might just not see them as clearly with exceptions. The Ocean Gate submarine, as you probably know, did not meet regulated specifications for deep-sea submersibles, and it pretty dramatically failed as a result. Those people died needlessly just because the owner wanted to save a buck. I'm sure you can conjure up no shortage of further examples. Have another on the house. The ongoing opioid crisis, driven majorly by one single company, Purdue Pharmaceutical, in which a company took advantage of people's pain and trust in doctors to create a rabid, addicted consumer base, causing overdose deaths to skyrocket in the last decade, including over 80,000 in 2021. A libertarian would tell you that these deaths were the fault of the passengers, or in the case of opioids, the addicts, that they should have spent the time to do their own research. They likely would have told you the same about the dial painters ingesting radioactive paint. The problem with that mindset, other than the fact that it always comes in hindsight, is that most individuals simply don't have the time, resources, or possibly education to thoroughly research these things themselves especially when they're already struggling financially and, in the case of addicts, in constant pain. At best, the idea is out of touch, wishful thinking. I mean, that's why society exists, right? We created a collective so that individual specialities and strengths could be leveraged to prop up the whole. If everyone had the capability to conduct honest-to-God research on radium paint or opioids or even the entire mortgage market before making decisions, that would be great. But being an expert takes time, time that people don't have when they're just trying to get by. And that doesn't even consider the fact that you need to multiply that time by any amount of possibly risky decisions that you have to take in your adult life. Bear in mind, the risks themselves aren't always clear at the time, not even to the experts. Think about the radium craze in the 20s and how it was common knowledge that the stuff was just the darndish, gosh golly swell thing ever. It just isn't feasible to be knowledgeable on every topic. So instead, people put their trust in experts. At some point, no matter what, no matter how self-reliant you believe yourself to be, you will need to rely on experts too. And those experts need to be held to account, especially when their interests don't necessarily align with the public. US Radium and Radium Dial both betrayed the trust of their employees. They knew from early days that their practices were going to hurt if not kill people. And while you might say that the system worked, that in the end it was self-healing, that the correct regulations got put in place, dozens of women still died. And those that didn't almost universally had health issues for the rest of their lives. Were they not to speak up, who knows how long it would have been, how many more would have followed them before someone stepped in. In federal aviation, there's a saying, regulations are written in blood. The dial painters of New Jersey and Illinois learned this firsthand, unfortunately. However, there's no reason that this must always be the case. We, the populace, the workforce, can enact protections in a more proactive way. 
We can change things for the better if we vote for people who craft policies with the public interest in mind. I wasn't sure how to end this, to be honest, so maybe it's a little high-minded or naive, but I'm cautiously optimistic for the future. When I look online and at many of my peers, I see generations that have experienced many of these events and are fed up with it. If they can find the will to make their voice heard, change can be made. I thought I heard something about spaghetti. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is just going. Okay. Oh my God, now I can't say it. Procure employment. Procure employment. <laughs> Why? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Why?